So when we talk about choosing treatments for cancer, we obviously tend to take recourse to to guidelines, and this is a good way to start because uh, this is ultimately a synopsis of the evidence as uh, has been put together by the experts. But it is nice to know the limits of the guidelines because guidelines are basically a consensus of many you know, people sitting together, and oftentimes, uh, they, as they themselves admit uh, in the NCCN and elsewhere, this is based on low-level evidence. There is no high-level evidence that exists on most situations and on clinical experience. So it's not that these are sacrosanct, but yes, they are the best available evidence. They are the best way to move forward. Nevertheless, what you also need to keep in mind that when you take calls on what is known as evidence-based management, and this is about choosing wisely, so only one leg of the three-legged stool is evidence. So evidence is important, but that is only one leg of the three of the three pegs of evidence-based medicine. The other peg is clinical judgment, and the next is patient preference, or what is also known as patient expectation, clinical experience of physician experience, and evidence. So evidence exists, but evidence is not quite top grade, and is to be uh, used with physician experience and expectation if you want clinic, if you want to do evidence-based medicine. And uh, when you look at these guidelines, they invariably talk to you only about the tumor points, the tumor factors. So what to do in a T1 to T2 patient, which may be aggressive or may be ulcerated, is, is about all that the guideline would try and synopsize for you. But when you take calls for patients, you need to do other things. You need to look at what the comorbidities are. Can the patient tolerate the treatment that you propose? What is the patient's life expectancy otherwise? If patient has bad pulmonary disease or bad uh, cardiac disease, is it worthwhile to look at a treatment which is very toxic but has the potential to give you 10 years, or should you look at something less? Should you look at high-risk surgery which the patient cannot tolerate? And then, of course, there's the other factor of looking at the social factors in terms of what the patient wants, or again, patient preference and the family support, and also, finally, in a non-ideal world, the financial support. Fortunately, where we live, we don't get too worried about the financial bits because we work at a public sector hospital, but the reality of the world is that this is also a major factor. I particularly like this paper, which came out many, many years ago, because it said that outcomes can be improved by people getting together at specialized treatment centers and working in teams. So this is important. Uh, Evidence is coming in at a rapid rate, and expertise is moving and changing. And if you have patients who are treated in a combined head and neck unit, then it does make a difference to, to the hazard for, uh, for having a, a recurrence, so to say. So this is important. Probably the most effective intervention you can do for your patients in general is to just have a small head and neck clinic. I think the point was made in the morning that having a large head and neck clinic may be counterproductive. Dr. Hare talked about that with 20 people, but certainly a, a small clinic with a radiation and a, radi and a surgeon, radiation oncologist, surgeon and medical oncologist is certainly. So the other issue, of course, is that when it comes to oral cancers, there are many kinds of oral cancers. So Dr. Anand asked me, am I going to talk about trunk cancer or buccal mucosa? <laughs> the issue is oral cancer is many kinds of cancers. In our own practice, the tongue and the floor of mouth is about one third and the other cancers of the buccal alveolar complex is more frequent. That is not quite the situation with the data you get from the West. Even from the South, I have seen that South India often has a different kind of uh, distribution, but at least in our uh, distribution and in North India, this is what you tend to get. Buccal alveolar cancers are more common than tongue cancers. The good news is that the proportion of early cancers is improving, is increasing. So this is our latest audit. Dr. Atul Sharma is very much part and parcel of this audit. And if you look at this, then 35 patients of a patient are now coming in early stage. And we are getting fairly good outcomes, both in terms of disease-free survival, which you see is at 80% at three years, and overall survival. The bad news by our count is that patients are generally younger than they used to be. We have patients who can be as young as 20. We have patients even younger than that who present to us. And this is primarily because of the oral tobacco epidemic that is on us at this moment. This is younger than uh, reports uh, from India in previous years and is significantly younger than the reports from the West with regard to the average age of patients presenting with oral cancer. What is also uh, be becoming obvious to us as we do our audit is that uh, patients who are younger do twice as bad. This is just coming through and uh, this is obviously worrying. 
it seems to be aggressive disease, primarily tobacco related. So now I'll come to the treatment issues, and this is more addressed to people who actually practice uh, or are training to practice. So a few issues that I would like to advise you on on what we have learned over the years, which uh, is responsible for the, for the good results that we now get with this early cancer situation in oral cancer. So I'll skip a few things. In terms of radiology, I think Dr. Arya already made the point that the guidelines tend to tell us to do a fair bit of radiology, but in the oral cavity, the, uh, the clinical examination tells you far, far more than, uh, than, uh, than radiology does. I mean, it's not the lung, it's not the breast, it's not the pancreas. You can see everything there is to see. You can palpate everything there is to palpate. And clinical examination tells you a lot more than radiology does. So we do do XHS for distant metastasis. That's a routine. And for occult neck nodes, it's generally wise to do some testing. In the usual world, we would do a CECT, but as I said, it's not quite necessary. You can get by without it if you do a good clinical examination and take your calls on when to do it. And if you look at the Indian guidelines, they don't quite insist on the CECTs and the, they talk about the ultrasound and the XHS. This, I think, is important, uh, is that uh, primary radiation is not the first-line treatment for oral cancer. It's very unusual. Um, very few situations wherein primary radiation is the is the right treatment in the early situation. Uh, so, in situations uh, wherein this is, these is from the buccal mucosa guidelines from the ICMR this this listing. So, in situations where there is a lesion which is not too large, certainly not more than T2, generally less than three centimeters, and away from bone and not too deep, probably is radiation appropriate. Otherwise, in most situations wherein a lesion is close to tongue, is close to bone, you're not quite uh, keen on radiation. Of course, if there's a neck node and radiation alone is probably not a good way of treating these patients. So as I said, primary surgical treatment is usually preferred. You have to give consideration to what to do to the primary, obviously appropriate surgical margins. I'll rush through a little bit of this because there are not too many of us who are surgeons here. But generally, you're looking at mucosal margins of 1 to 1.5 centimeters of unstretched mucosa and one layer beyond the involved layer or a compartmental resection. Of course, you have to get the right surgical access to do it. I'll skip that for this audience. And uh, you have to give consideration to the risk of occult lymph node meds. So early cancers, obviously, don't have lymph node meds. We just heard about the staging, don't have lymph node meds. But there are some patients who will have occult lymph node meds. That is, they're not, aware, they're not quite picked up on, on clinical or radiological uh, evaluation, but yet have microscopic uh, metastatic uh, uh, spread to the lymph nodes. And the risk increases as you go laterally. So the risk is maximum for the tongue, less for the floor of mouth, less for the alveolus, less for the buccal mucosa, less for upper alveolus, and less for hard palate. And the risk also increases as tumors get deeper. So in general, you can take a call based on these parameters as to what are the risks. Certainly the risks are very low for a superficial lesion on the heart palate, and the risks are fairly high for all lesions of the tongue. But uh, in general, if you're not doing risk stratification, it's probably sensible today to treat the neck prophylactically. And again, to make small exceptions on that, which can probably come out in the, in the, in the panel as we come through. I leave the reconstruction bits because of lack of time, but just say that uh, it's not always a free flap. We use many uh, flaps, which are regional flaps or non-free flaps, and yet get good functional outcomes. So thank you. I just uh, conclude, which is to say that evidence-based medicine is about guidelines and evidence, but not only about evidence and guidelines. And there's a lot that you have to consider, which is about tumor factors, patient factors, and social factors. And uh, that's a list of wise choices which you can apply. So thank you. Mm -hmm.